Hey, welcome everyone. I'm Jake Lester. Um, I have the um, great privilege and opportunity to share to you today uh, this message from River City Church. Uh, I, I sincerely appreciate your, um, your commitment to community, um, wherever you're at, however you're watching this. Um, I, I appreciate your, the time you're taking to do that and to listen to what we have to say here. Um, and, and I just pray God would bless you wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that he would infiltrate your life with his truth and his spirit, and that, uh, and that you would um, be on this road of formation into people of love in Christ with us. So we're going, uh, we're going through this book by John Mark Comer called Practicing the Way. And I don't know if it, it, it just things that God has already been stirring in me or, or the timing of it, but man, when I read this book, it just hit me where I was at. It just put words to things that my mind was trying to formulate. It, it, um, it made um, things make sense that weren't so clear. And it's really just John Mark Comer's um, way of, of describing the practices that Jesus um, made a habit of while he was on the earth with us. And, and then how we can also become his apprentices, practice those things in our life. So if you haven't bought the book, please do. Um, if you haven't started reading it, please start reading it. If you stopped reading it, I just encourage you, pick it back up, give it another chance, because there are some great, great things that he has to say in this book. So this is week five in this sermon series um, as we study through Practicing the Way. And um, we are on week two of the goal of uh, becoming like Jesus. And, and so the, the, the goal of an apprentice, right? We are, we are all called to be apprentices of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. The goal of any disciple um, is to be with their rabbi, their master, uh, to become like their rabbi, uh, and then to do the things that the rabbi does. And so those are our goals. As we apprentice under Jesus, we want to become, we want to be with him, we want to become like him, we want to do the things that he does. And so this week we're talking again about becoming like Jesus. The big idea here is answering the question, how do we transform? So last week, Kevin talked about, he, did, he had a great message on what is spiritual formation. And then this week we're going to talk about, okay, that's what it is. How do we do it? Um, and so, so that's the big idea. The, the working definition that John Mark Comer has for spiritual transformation is the process of being formed into a person of self-giving love through deepening surrender to and union with the Trinity. I'm going to read that again. The process of being formed into a person of self-giving love through deepening surrender to and unity with the Trinity. Um, I, I just, I find that so, um, just, just captivating. I find that such a good description of what the spiritual transformation journey is to look like. And one thing he talks about in his book is this, this thing called the critical journey. And it's these six steps that every believer goes through in their formation process. And I'm going to explain it a little bit different um, because in the book it kind of explains it as like over your lifetime you kind of go through this critical journey. And I do believe that. Definitely the case. Overview look. We're going to go through this critical journey. But also it seems like there are times in our lives where it's actually cyclical, where we're going through this critical journey time and time again, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you how that kind of works out. So I'm just going to jump right into it, though. This is the critical journey because, as Kevin said um, last week, there, there, there are, um, we are always being formed. We are always being formed by something, by the shows we watch, the books we, we read, the things we listen to, the relationships we had, 
have, um, the relationships we had in the past, things our parents did to us, things that others did to us, we're always being formed. And that's more of a, a passive formation, something that we're not really thinking about. It's just happening to us. Now, our goal, though, as we pursue Jesus, as we per- pursue the way of Jesus, is actually to turn that passive into an active, intentional formation. And, and so this, this critical journey is, is like, it's the idea that there are, no, there are no accidental saints. You don't just, you know, wake up one day and you're like, oh, oh, wow, I'm, I'm obeying all the commandments in the, in the Bible. Or, oh, wow, I am fully mature in Christ. And I don't even know how it happened. It just happened. It, that, that's just not how spiritual formation works. It actually is an intentional thing, a thing where we have to play our part. God is always willing to play his part, but we have to do it intentionally and actively. And so that, that's what kind of this critical journey is hinting at. And so I'm just going to step through it. Stage one is recognition of God. And so if you think of like when you first started following Jesus, this is like, you know, you realize uh, my life isn't being full of of, of good things. That my life isn't full of victories. My life, there, there are things missing that I, I actually don't have the power within myself to bring about. There are things that I need. There are things that I want. Love, joy, peace, patience, all those things, and I can't do it by myself. So there's this recognition of God. Oh, God, you are actually the one that has to come into my life and do this. So the recognition of God, and then the next stage is life of discipleship. This is where we start to follow Jesus, learn about Jesus, and, and become, and try to become more like him. We, we actually are taught by the master to become like him. So then we move to stage three, and it's the productive life. Actually, there's, there's fruit that grows from this. As we follow Jesus, learn about Jesus, become like him, we Actually, there's fruit that is produced in our, in our lives and the lives around us. And so that's the productive life of stage three. But then there is um, what we call a wall. And, and here's, here's how it happens. As you're growing in the Lord, this has happened to me many, many times. As you're growing in the Lord, our loving, trustworthy Father uh, will, will point to something in our lives and say, Hey, Jake. Um, this thing right here, this is not contributing to proper formation. It's not f- helping form you into a person of love in Christ. This thing is actually hindering you. And it could be an addiction. It could be a, a, uh, you know, a way of thinking. It could be a relationship. It could be a habit or a hobby. Um, it could be a series that you're into. It, it, I mean, it could be so many things, but our loving, trustworthy Father says, this thing's not helping. Can you please give it to me? He, he doesn't say, I'm going to take it. He says, can you please hand this thing over? And then we call this the wall because at that point we have a choice. We can either choose to trust our loving and trustworthy Father and hand it over, or we can actually say, which I have done in my life, where we can say, no, actually, God, that thing is too important to me. It might be a hurt that we're holding on to. It might be a secret sin that we don't want to confess. We don't want to let out. But he's saying, no, this thing isn't helping you. And so, so if we say no, that doesn't mean he kicks us out of the kingdom of God. Thankfully, he's so gracious and merciful. He doesn't do that. But what it will do is it will arrest our progress in maturing in Christ. It will it will. Um, It will quickly bring an end to our growth in Christ. But let's say we say yes. Let's say, you know, we say, yes, Lord Jesus, I recognize that. Thank you so much. Here is that thing. We stop doing it or we stop thinking that or we confess it or whatever it is. And we continue. So stage four is the journey inward where where God points to those things deep inside of us. And that's his goal is to get his truth and his healing so deep inside of us that it becomes a part of us. And that's the journey inward. And if we say yes to him and we allow him to do that work, well, then changes are made and fruit is produced. I mean, there is, there is opportunity for new life. Sometimes we don't even realize how much those things in our life that hold us back 
are holding us back or how much time they're taking from us or energy they're taking from us as we think about them or struggle with them. And so we, we actually do this journey inward, but then we have this journey outward. That's stage five of we start living this life with this new freedom, with this new way of thinking about life, with this healing. We live life. So that's the journey outward. And, we, and then stage six is called life of love. And that is just where we are becoming more and more people of love. So that's, that's kind of the journey. But the cyclical part is soon we realize that it's not like we become, uh, you know, uh, the next degree of people of love and then we can just do it by ourselves from then on, right? We actually realize that, oh man, I, to walk in this new freedom, I still need God, which only makes sense, right? And so we have a new recognition of God. We go back to stage one. We recognize how much we need him. We go back to stage two. We start learning about and, and following Jesus closer. And we go back to stage three and there's fruit that's being produced from it, right? But then inevitably, and it's going to happen time and time again, our good, loving Father, trustworthy Father is going to point to something and say, I need this. Now this thing, just like, you know, like we're onions and he just, he peeled off one layer and he's going deeper. This thing I'm, I'm going to need. Um, I ask you to give it to me. And then we have that choice again. We're at that wall again. And so I have experienced this many times, this critical journey. And so my, my encouragement is that we would recognize that he is a loving and trustworthy father. This is maybe one of the most important lessons we will learn as believers is that we can trust him, that he has our best interests in mind every day, all day, and he only wants that spiritual formation to take place. So that's the critical journey. There are no accidental saints because we can stop and say, no, Lord, I, I cannot hand this over to you. And then, and then we're choosing to sit out until he will revisit it. He'll come back to it and he'll say, okay, what about now? Can I have this thing now? We have to be intentional and active about seeking him out, trusting him, and walking in that freedom. So before, I, before we talk about more of, of how we are transformed, I want to just paint the picture of what we are pursuing, okay? It's like in, you know, in, in all of creation, we need to know what we're pursuing. In, in all of our, you know, the kingdom of God, what are we pursuing? Well, what we're pursuing is a time when Jesus comes back, sets everything right, removes all sin and all of sin's tentacles, and adds a, 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 uh, a full realization of his shalom, of his order, of his way of doing life. That's what we're looking toward. And he's going to do that in all of us as well one day. And this is what it looks like. This is what John Mark Comer says it looks like. He calls it our deepest and truest selves. That, that is the goal that we're shooting toward, is our deepest and truest selves. The self that God had in mind when he willed us into existence before time began. People full of agape love. It's that agape love is that selfless, self-sacrificial love who looks out for the interests of others. People full of agape love and living the life of the kingdom of God into every corner of human existence. Man, I love that. That we are called to be transformed ourselves and then live out that life of love into every corner of human existence. That's the goal. That's what will happen one day. But from this day to that day, that's what we're called to do and be, is to be filled with God, to be with Him, to become like Him, to do the things that He does into our communities, into our families, into the life around us. That's our goal. So, we might say, I don't know if that's possible, Jake. Uh, we might give excuses, like I've given these excuses, you know, like when I was young, my parents would be like, hey, this thing, you know, that you're doing, uh, that's not what Jesus would be doing. And I'd be like, well, I'm not Jesus. I'm not perfect, you know, or, or uh, this is just part of my personality. You're just going to have to get used to it. You know, sometimes we, we, we use those excuses to, to stop 
the growth that, we, that should be taking place in our life that we've just, we're just deciding that's too hard, that's too difficult. Um, instead, I'm just going to not be active about that, not be intentional about growth in my life in that area. And I just say that, that is not what we're called to do. It's just, it's not. The, the call is to become our truest and deepest selves. And so I want to I wanna take us to Matthew 7. Um, this is, for context, this is the tail end of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew. And arguably, this is the most uh, famous sermon that Jesus gave. Um, and what he does in this sermon is he lays out the order of God, the shalom of God, the way things God intends it to be. The, 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 um, he lays out this full realization of this is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is how it looks in your life. This is how it looks in your relationships. This is how it looks in your relationship with God. And even many people look at this and they're like, no way. We're not, you know, this is like, this is like Jesus' pie in the sky idea of what we're supposed to be. But there's no way this is possible for the average human being. But listen to what, listen to what Jesus says here in chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. You guys have heard this. I have no doubt you've heard it many times. But this is what he says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So he just preached this whole sermon. He says, everyone who hears all that puts them into practice. There's that word again, practice, doing. He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. So here's a guy who hears all that he puts it into practice, and he actually builds, builds his house upon this firm foundation. And his, the house is all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our security, our future, everything we're building on this firm foundation. And so when the trials of life come, and the, and the trauma comes, and the disaster comes, guess what? We are able to stand on this firm foundation of who we are in Christ, on these, these practices that we have built into our life, and we're able to continue life. There's an alternative, though. So everyone who hears these words of mine does not put them into practice. He, he's like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, I think, I think Jesus is, you know, saying this with pain in his heart because he knows, he knows that people that are listening to the sermon, they're going to be ones who listen and they don't put it into practice. And all their hopes and dreams, all of their um, security, uh, their future is going to be dashed. It's going to crash, just like it says, and it falls with a great crash. Let us not be those people. Let's hear his words, see his example, and put them into practice in our lives so that we can be standing on the firm foundation of who he is. He's saying, listen, guys, I know this is hard. And you know what? You're not going to be able to do it on yourself. You're not going to be able to do it by yourself. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, through community, through these practices, you can be people who hear it and put it into practice and be standing on the firm foundation. So, then, how do we do this? We have, before we get into that, I'm just going to quickly go over some losing strategies. How we don't do it. Okay, how, how are we formed? Well, we'll get into that. But I'm going to talk about how... There are, these are losing strategies for spiritual formation, okay? And I, I wish I could get into them more, but I can't. So please go look at them at pages 84 through 89. Um, but here's, here's the, here, here they are. Willpower. Willpower is great for uh, things that willpower can do, okay? But it's not great for doing the heavy lifting of deep spiritual transformation, of healing deep wounds 
deep areas of trauma. Your willpower cannot touch those. Addiction, your willpower cannot touch that. But your willpower can do some things. It can keep you from grabbing that uh, second cookie at dessert. It can, when you wake up, keep you from grabbing your phone and, and instead go grab your Bible. It can lead you to the practices but it can't do the heavy lifting that's required for deep spiritual formation. So use it for what it can be used for, but don't expect it to do what it can't do. Next one, more Bible study. And you're thinking, Jake, uh, you're, getting, you're getting in trouble here. Here's the idea, guys, stick with me. We, there's, there's, this, there's this lie that we've been told that more information equals transformation. And... And we get all kinds of information. I mean, you can go uh, to, to church on Sundays. You can listen to podcasts. You can, you can you know, read scripture. Like, there is no um, lack of information. But it's not, remember what Jesus said, it's not just hearing the words. It's putting them into practice. So just more Bible study, it, that is a losing strategy for transformation. The, ne the next one is the zap from heaven, right? So this is like... Jake is an angry person. Zinga! Jake's not an angry person anymore. Sweet! Jake is a prideful person. Zinga! Jake's not a prideful person anymore. Right? Wouldn't we love if that's just how it happened? And, and I'm not saying that God doesn't sometimes bring those, those moments of deep healing, those moments of healing our physical body, our minds, and our hearts. But to rely on those spiritual highs for our lifelong spiritual formation, it's not a winning strategy. But please go. He goes into more detail on those in the book, pages 84 to 89. Here's his working theory of change. Okay, so I think it's, I think it's on the screen. This is the working theory of change. Uh, we have teaching, practices, community. All three of these are centered around the work of the Holy Spirit, His power, His relationship in our lives. And then it's over time, and it's through suffering. Uh, we love that last one. I know we do. And, and so I'm going to talk about each of these. The first, teaching. But Jake, I thought you just said we don't need more Bible study. Definitely true. But truth is important. Um, hear this. A.W. Tozer says, what comes in, I love this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. We have to have a clear picture of who God is. So if you think about that critical journey, we're never going to trust God if we don't know that he's trustworthy. And he is. And that can be a deep area of spiritual formation, depending on how your father or your mother or the person that raised you treated you, you might have a different idea about what a heavenly father will act like. So we have to believe, we have to have this clear picture of who God is. And that's what scripture is about, is scripture is showing us who God is through the ages so that we can trust in him to do what he wants to do in our lives. So teaching, vitally important. Truth, vitally important. That's what the Sermon on the Mount was, right? Jesus, Jesus um, taught them, and then he said, put it into practice. So teaching, vitally important. But then the practices, the practice part, right? Jesus says, this is the teaching, but you need to put it into practice. And so the practices in the book are on page 225. Um, the, the, that's where the list is, and I'll, I'll go through it. Here's the list. Sabbath, solitude, prayer, community, scripture, fasting, generosity, service, and witness. Those are the practices. Um, and he gives great uh, descriptions of them on page 225. But here's the thing. They are not an equation. You can't think of this list as like, okay, if I just do these things, then I will be spiritually formed. That's not, you're going to be, you're going to be let down by that mindset. Here's what the practices are there for. They are, um, just, like I, just like I have here, they make space for us to surrender to God. That's it. And our willpower, 
we, you know, we need our willpower to engage in these practices. You know, I, I'm laying in bed and I don't want to spend some time in prayer, right? Well, I need a little bit of willpower to get off my bed. I mean, I can pray right there, but maybe change settings, spend time in prayer. That's where willpower comes in. But as we engage in those, we surrender. We have to be surrendering ourselves to God so that he can do the work in us that only he can do. So those are the practices. The next part is community. And, you know, we, we're okay at community. Some of us better than others. Um, we do gather. But I would challenge you, um, gathering with people is not necessarily community. Community is built around being known and knowing. Um, Community is built around a, a, a trust that is built sometimes over years with people to speak in, to allow them to speak into our lives and to speak into their lives. And, and we need each other. We, we need each other to mature in Christ. I'm just going to read some excerpts from Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read some of it that just highlight this. So Jesus gives us gifts. Um, Fivefold ministry is talked about here, but he says, so that the body of Christ, this is, this is Paul speaking or writing, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. So we're all built up together, um, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Not a quarter measure, not a half measure, but to the full measure. Again, this speaks to really the goal, the plan, what we should set our minds on is being in that whole measure in the fullness of Christ. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Grow in every respect into the body of Christ. The body grows and builds itself up in love as each one does its work. Listen, I need you to do the work, to allow God to do the work in you. You need me to surrender to God, to become formed into a person of love in Christ. We need each other so that we can grow up and mature with each other in this. So community is, is vital to that formation process. The next one is the Holy Spirit. All of it is centered around the Holy Spirit. Um, again, um, the Holy Spirit is the one who does the heavy lifting. This is our ultimate source of spiritual, uh, uh, of spiritual formation. He's the one who can reach down into our lives as we surrender to. In that critical journey, as God points to something, we surrender it. As we surrender to God, he, the Holy Spirit is the one who reaches into our lives, makes, creates healing, um, changes us and forms us. Of course, we need the Holy Spirit in all of these areas. Teaching, practices, community, all centered around the Holy Spirit. He makes a way for us to be with God anytime, anywhere. I'm, I'm standing here, but I, I could be in my car. I could be um, at home. I could be in the grocery store, and I can just stop. And through the Holy Spirit, I can say, Lord God, I invite you into this space, into this time. Thank you so much for being here with me. He, he, is, he makes a, a way for us to be with him anytime, anywhere. So this formation process, though, isn't a quick process, is it? Um, I think all of us know that. It happens over time. So that's the next part. I love this quote from the book. Spiritual formation is the slowest of all human movements. The slowest of all human movements. So don't get angry at yourself if, you're, if God's working on something within you and it's, you're not completely free of it tomorrow or next week or in a month, or maybe in years. Maybe this is a decades-long process that God is, is, is doing within you to bring freedom that he so wants to be there. Maybe we won't be free of all these things, reaching full, this full maturity, this idea of full maturity in Christ, until we're in our 50s, or 60s, or 70s, or 80s. 
but our goal is to continue into the formation. But it's going to happen over time. It takes a long time, but it will also take a lot of time. So the more we give ourselves to it, the more it will happen, the more the process will unfold, the more we give ourselves to it each day, the faster the process will happen. So remember, if we stop at that wall and we stop giving ourselves to the process of spiritual formation, we will stop growing. I mean, we might grow a little bit here and there, but it's possible that there will be baby Christians uh, their whole life and never grow into the full maturity that they're called to, to grow into. So we don't want to be those. We, 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 we want to be seeking formation actively and intentionally. So then this last part, we all love this. Somebody in the back of the room, somebody there at home is like, yes, suffering for Jesus, I love it. Right? No, probably not. But if there are, they're actually right. So, through suffering, this is what John Mark Comer calls the process of sadness leaving the body. Remember what James says in the first chapter of his letter, right? He says, we, let's count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience, or another way to say it is long-suffering. The testing of our faith produces long suffering. And let long suffering have its perfect, its complete work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We, we, we go through this in suffering, in little ways and in big ways. I have this joke, and maybe it's just a joke to me. Maybe my kids and wife don't, don't think it's a joke. Um, they don't think it's funny, but when we're going through something hard or they're going through something hard, I would just say, man, what a great opportunity for formation in your life right now. And I don't, I, sometimes I say it lightly, but most times I don't say it lightly because, because that is really the truth. I've tried to incorporate this into my life. Whether I am, you know, doing a chore that I don't want to do, washing the dishes again, picking up after the kids again, or or I'm going through something really difficult, um, and maybe a formation thing that's really difficult, but I've just tried to make it a practice of inviting Jesus into that situation, saying, Lord, I want to walk through this suffering, even this little bit of suffering, with you, to make a habit of walking with you through this. And the hope is that we, we practice enough, that we create a habit, so that when real suffering comes along, because you know it will, and I know Many of you have suffered so much more than I have. But the goal is that when real suffering comes along, we've already practiced, we've already made it a habit of walking with the Lord, walking with the Holy Spirit through those things. Having a sense of joy, even if we're not enjoying it in the moment, having a sense of joy that this is working toward my spiritual formation and my maturity in Christ. So it doesn't happen on accident. You can't just let it happen passively. If you suffer and you don't engage um, intentionally with the Lord, you will just suffer. It will just be hard. And it might form you in other ways, in, in ways that aren't good for your soul. But it is possible to be formed well in Christ through suffering. So, wrapping up here, the question is again, Jake, is this even possible? You might still be unconvinced. You might be thinking, what you're asking me to do, Jake, is not possible. And guess what? A um, little weight off my shoulders. I'm not the one asking you to do it. Okay? Jesus actually is asking all of us to do this together. He's asking us to do it. Here's something John Mark Comer says, which, again, I love. He just has a way with words. I love it. He says, something approaching Christ-likeness is possible in this life. It really is. We can be healed. We can be set free of broken patterns that stretch back generations. We can be transformed into people who are genuinely pervaded by love and joy and peace. Our souls can throb with bliss of union with God. Our bodies can become temples, our neighborhoods holy ground, our days eternity and time, our moments miracles. 
but it doesn't happen on accident. It happens intentionally. And Jesus simply says, come, follow me. Hear my words, see my practices, put them into practice in your life. So, each, each of these um, teachings in the series, we're also pairing them with a practice. So the practice today is Scripture. And you say, Jake, you said that Scripture, more Bible study isn't the answer. Totally. But I also said that truth is paramount, is key. Scripture is one of the practices that we have to incorporate more fully in our lives. This is the way John Mark Comer describes it, a, cum- a, a community of courageous fidelity to orthodoxy. So a, a courageous sticking to truth in a culture of ideological compromise through the practice of Scripture. So we live in a culture, a, a world system that is compromising all the time on truth. But we have an opportunity to live in courageous fidelity to orthodoxy, to, to truth. In Romans, I just want to highlight Romans 12 too. You probably know it, but it says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, our, we have been shaped not only by the world today, we actually have been shaped by Western culture for generation after generation after generation. In some ways, we look at Scripture itself through the lens of how we've been formed in the Western world, generation after generation after generation. What Paul's saying here to the Romans is, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. His way of doing things. His perfect shalom. If we give ourselves to this transformation process, then we will be able to test and approve that perfect will of God and live it in our lives around us. Thank you so much. Um, My hope is that you would... And I don't mean to be harsh, but that you'd stop making excuses and that you would press into the Lord, that you would fill your life with teaching, the practices, community, all centered around the Holy Spirit, knowing that over time, it's going to change you and form you and shape you, that you trust the Lord, you trust the process, even in suffering. Thank you so much. Have a great day.